Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here as we begin our worship time together. We'll be having baptism, and so in just a few moments, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll begin with this, the ordinance of baptism. It's always exciting when we start a service this way. So if you would just quiet your heart before the Lord as we pray, and then if you're a guest or visitor, be sure to fill out the information in this little folder and the seat in front of you there. We'd like to have a record of your visit and, and uh, just know that if there's anything we can do as uh, Fellowship Baptist Church, we're here to minister to you and your needs. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Lord God, we just thank you so much for this day, for the time that we can gather here together, for this time of worship and how exciting it is that a new believer has come in obedience to the command that you have given us to be baptized. And, and as we observe this ordinance, may it be a reminder to all of us that have already committed our lives to you of what you did for us, because it's a picture of death, burial, and the resurrection. And so we just thank you, Father, for this uh, time together as we continue on in our worship. Uh, may it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. What a joy it is to begin our time together with the celebration of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And coming this morning for baptism is Chloe Williams. Uh, she came to me last week and said she wanted to be baptized, and so we talked about that for a minute and then spent some time this week talking about that, and she understands the gospel. She knows who Christ is and what he has done for you. And Chloe... Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Yes. Then upon your profession, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. Please stand as we sing together and as we worship the Lord together. He is a God that is everlasting to everlasting. He is forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God in peace. His love endures forever. For His good is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praises. Sing praises. The mighty hand and us rest on. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. Forever, sing praises, 
rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. starting chapter 7, verse 1. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm. And when the spring crop began to sprout, and behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing, and it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand for he is small? The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Thus the Lord showed me. And behold, the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire, and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand, for he is small? The Lord changed his mind about this. This too 
shall not be, said the Lord. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by the vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolated, and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. Then I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all of his words. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and there do your prophesying. But no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of a king and a royal residence. Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from the following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now hear the word of the Lord, you who are saying, You shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore says the Lord, Your wife shall become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by the measuring line, and you yourself will die upon the unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go into its land into exile. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a great word that is for us today. Father, I'm thank remember the words of which our Lord and G Savior Jesus Christ said as he prayed for the disciples and for the church. He said, Father, sanctify them with your truth, for your word is truth. I'm reminded of the words of where Jesus, our Lord, as he stood before Pontius Pilate, he said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate walked away and said, what is truth? Father, today, as you stretch forth your plumb line, your word is truth. The world will be judged out of this book, out of your word. You're not a source of truth, Father. You are truth. And so, Father, today I pray for Rob as he preaches your word, as the plumb line is stretched forth across this congregation. The plumb line will reveal that which is crooked. Lord, I pray that those here today will be examining, examining themselves to see if, in fact, they're in the faith. Oh, Lord, let your work do what it was sanctified to do. Let your word be true. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we give our tithes and offerings today, the praise team and worship team is going to sing psalm 23 this is a new version of the psalm 23 uh, we've many of you probably have not heard it yet but it's going to be our song of the month for next month but i want you to hear it and so the words will be up there you can follow along uh, those that know it can sing it but there's probably no psalm in that ministers in times of deep grief and sorrow and not just during those times but through it's such a comforting psalm to us all to know that the Lord is our shepherd and that he's shepherding us. And uh, so listen as we sing, sing along if you know it. Um, let the words of this psalm minister to, to you today. Oh, 
shepherd I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his name. Would you please stand now as we sing together all to us. He is everything to us as we live our lives each day. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful. To the end, we are waiting on you, Jesus. We leave your all to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation. Of the 
voice of God be the holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. Only some for the bringing of the word I want to read a section of scripture and I want you guys to really pay attention it's in Luke 24 now behold two of them were traveling hold on (laughs) I want you guys to know this happened three days after Christ was crucified. And this is, what's, this is what's going to happen. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together all of the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is that that you have one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that you don't know the things which have happened in these last days? And he said, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, 
mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he who was going to redeem Israel, indeed, besides all of this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they also had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, and certain of those who went with us went to the tomb and found it just as women had said, but Jesus was not there. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in with them to stay. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said one to another, Did our hearts not burn within us when he talked with us on the road and when he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who was with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the book of Hebrews, that the Holy Spirit inspired the writer to describe to us a Jesus that is perfect, a Jesus that is so awesome, Lord, last week we first heard of Melchizedek mentioned in Hebrews. And Lord, we know that the Bible said that you, by the prophets, would come through the line of Judah, through the line of David, the kingly line. And yet, Lord, you are described as our high priest. But Lord, you did not come from Aaron or the Levi's. Lord, but you are of the order of Melchizedek, the priest of the all-high God. Thank you, God, that you clarified to us your right to be priest through Melchizedek. And Lord, thank you that it doesn't say that you were made like him, Lord, but it says that he was made like you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the understanding that you fulfilled every part of the prophecy to become our salvation, to become that perfect Savior, the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect priest that would offer up once and for all the ultimate sacrifice of yourself. We thank you today for that and look forward to learning more. Lord, I beg you today that through Rob's preaching that the Holy Spirit come when the word is opened and bring the word alive to us today so that we, like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, will leave here saying, were our hearts not burning as the Holy Spirit opened the word to us, and then that we would leave this place ready to share with what we had learned. We pray this in your name. Amen.
heart, hand. What lights me up is the head. Now, that doesn't mean there's no heart. I am very passionate about a great many things. But I, the, the, it, the head really resonates with me. And I think, you know, that the, 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 the saying is, you know, that, or at least the kind of the general consensus of many is that men are more uh, head, women are more heart, but we all need to be more hand. And Hebrews 7, if we really just kind of look at it and read through it, is really very much a head oriented passage. There's a lot of information, a lot of things to think through. Uh, this whole Melchizedek is not something that just grips your heart right off the bat when you begin. He's very mysterious. It's kind of confusing. And even when you've sort of mapped through who he is, when you're like, okay, you've come to the conclusion, which I have at least, that he is an actual person. He was not an angel that uh, was just sort of this celestial being. Uh, he's not a pre-incarnate version of Christ. He's an actual person. And, and, and you kind of think through that, and then you start talking about why is he even mentioned? You know, he's mentioned only once in, the old, in, in Genesis, once in Psalms, and then it's not until Hebrews 7 that we really get good information about who he is, and he starts to make sense. And so as we look at this passage today, as we look at the scriptures today, right, what we're going to find, I think, is that right in the middle of this very head-oriented passage is just this, one of the most powerful heart messages in the entire Bible. In Genesis 1, 26, if you go all the way back and start thinking through from the beginning, Genesis 1, 26, it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, which is the first time we see the Trinity. And, and we, we learn from that that the Trinity is this perfect picture of relationship, this perfect unity in relationship. That's kind of a framework. Then the very next verse, it says, God created man in his own image, male and female. He created them. He created this very distinct complementary relationship, two individuals designed for one another, and that relational dynamic that we see in creation is literally woven into the DNA of every single person, of every single human ever born. And whether you're an extrovert or an introvert or a something else vert, God made you to be a relational being. And the exact structure and texture of what that relational thing looks like is going to be different. Different people have different needs and things in that. But one of the things we all have is we all have a need to be engaged in deep relationships. Of course, the husband-wife relationship is sort of the central core of that. Family relationships flow out of that. Friendships, fellow church members, all of that. And it kind of continues out from there. But we need to recognize that we were made for relationships. We were made for interaction. We all have the Imago Dei built into us. We have this inherent reflection of something of the character and nature of God in us as human beings. And, and when we look back even at the first descriptions of, of relationships between man and God, between Adam and Eve and God, it's just this beautiful, relational, amazingly intimate thing. And then the fall comes, Adam and Eve sinned, and everything changes. And as a result of that, all of our relationships are fractured. It, it's certainly, first and foremost, our relationship with God. But even as Christians, even as followers of Christ, sin taints everything. And it takes so much grace to be, and be able to engage in a way that honors God. And keep in mind today this need for relationship that is built into who we are, first and foremost with God, but also with one another. So today's passage, as we look at it, asks, answers a question that we need to ask. And the question that it, or the, the, the question that it asks is what is the big picture, overarching, ultimate purpose of God for us in salvation? That, that question comes out and is actually answered in this passage. And again, if we're just looking at it, it's very head-oriented in all of the details and the information and who is Melchizedek and what did the priests do and their, 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 their imperfection and the Aaronic priesthood and the uh, Levitical priesthood and this Melchizedek thing and this king and priest and, and, and king of righteousness, you know, king of Salem. All that stuff is very head-oriented, but right in the middle of that is just this heart that is actually at the center 
of what salvation and Christianity is. Uh, the, the answer to this question, uh, I think, has the pot- is not only going to grip the heart, but it really has the potential to move the hand greater than anything we've seen so far in Hebrews. So I'd invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're in Hebrews chapter 7. We begin our study this morning in verse 11 and go through the end of the chapter. This is the Word of the Lord, Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken, meaning Jesus, belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises, according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not according to a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is witnessed about him, about Jesus... You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath... But he, with an oath, through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much more, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. And the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins And then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And even in this passage that has so many challenges and so many details and so many things to think through, Lord, let us see the heart in this passage even more than all of the details. Let those details funnel us to a deeper love for you, a a deeper affection for you. Help this to cause us to love you more. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So Melchizedek will always be mysterious. He is possibly the least mentioned, most obscure figure in the Old Testament that is foundational to our understanding of Jesus as our great high priest. And so as we look at this passage today, and there's several things as we kind of work through it that we're going to see, the first thing that we're going to talk about is this idea of perfection. We talked about that a little bit last week, but the first two verses, verses 11 and 12, are about perfection. And one of the main things that this passage teaches us, one of the main things that we learn about Melchizedek, is that the priesthood was not perfect. Now, now to us, that seems like kind of a no-brainer, right? Because we've grown up, we trust in Jesus, and, and we did not grow up in this system where the priests are and all that stuff. But the priesthood was never intended to be perfect. It was never intended to be permanent. You remember, God called Abraham, and then he had this encounter with Melchizedek, and then everything else came. Then the covenant came. But it's important 
that as we start to think through this, we understand the meaning of the word perfect here in this passage. Here in this passage, it's really pointing us to the, the big picture aim of Christianity. It's talking about access to God. Yes, the idea of perfect connects to spiritual maturity and sanctification and growth, as we see certainly in Philippians 1.6. But here, the idea of perfect is essentially talking about salvation. The Levitical priests, which, which were descended from Aaron, not, Jesus was not, for a Levitical priest to be a Levitical priest, he had to trace his, his uh, lineage back up to Aaron. These were the priests, they offered daily sacrifices. They were absolutely essential to the religious system of the Old Testament. So if you think about, even in your own life, even today for us, what is the most important thing about our, uh, our Christianity day in, day out? We would talk first, of course, about Christ and what He did and, and the Holy Spirit. We would talk about the Bible, the Scriptures. But for the Old Testament Jew, they would think about the priests and the sacrifices that were made daily. But those sacrifices could not bring perfection because they were inherently imperfect. The law could not bring perfection. In fact, the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of the scriptures is to tell us how far away we really are from God. The priesthood could not accomplish this full reconciliation with God. And just because we don't live in that framework, just because we don't live in the framework of the sacrificial system needing to come in day in, day out, and again and again and again uh, to, to, to make peace with God and to, to try to reconcile with Him, don't think that there's no chance you're not in that boat just because we don't live in the Old Testament. The tendency of all of us, I think, <laughs> is, is to try to think or to try to figure out some way to, to, to work our way to heaven, some way to work our way to sanctification. Years ago, I was doing an evangelism training class, and, and we would go out and talk with people, and, and we learned a thing called the key question. Okay, the key question, and, and it's great. It's, it's very important, right? And the key question is, and we're supposed to, as you're engaging with people and talking to people, you're supposed to work your way to get to the key question. And I, I would be out sometimes, and, and we had a different person that was supposed to kind of start that, and I would reach in my pocket and rattle my key, say, okay, we've, we've chatted, it's time to ask the key question. This is the key question. In your personal opinion, what do you think it takes for someone to get to heaven? Which is, which is a great way to start the conversation. What do you think it takes, in your opinion? So it puts, it puts the emphasis on them. And then when they answer, you can say, well, can I tell you what I think the Bible says? Um, so it's a great way to start. But I'll tell you what, and, and there's, two form, there's two answers that you're going to get. You're either going to get a faith Bible answer, or you're going to get what we call a works answer. And I have asked that question to hundreds of people. 99% of the time, it's a works answer. It's some sort of do better, do more good, do less bad, get yourself right with God. And I think that that, 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 that desire to work my way back to God is built in to every culture, every civilization, every ethnicity, every demographic, and every single religion in the world outside of true biblical Christianity is actually a works-based system. And even as Bible-believing Baptists... I think sometimes we have the mindset of, if I'm doing all the right things, if I've checked all the right boxes, I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. Prayed the prayer, walked the aisle, got baptized. I do this, I do that, I'm good. If you remember the old Sunday school envelopes that, that we historically had, that Bible read daily, I brought my Bible to church, I, you know, all these little check boxes of things that I've done. It's built into our, our flesh to want to work our way there. But outside, and you know this, but I have to say it, outside of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross on our behalf, there is no way to work your way to God. Outside of what Jesus did, your sins will not be cleansed. You will not be free from its bondage, the bondage of sin. You will not be forgiven and you cannot have peace. But what the imperfect could not do, the whole religious system 
was essentially designed to show you that no, you can't do it. What the imperfect could not do, Jesus did. And when Jesus came, look at verse 12. When the priesthood is changed, that means from the Old Testament system to Jesus, our great high priest, when the priesthood is changed, of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. Judaism has been replaced. The old priesthood is obsolete, done, finished, put away, defunct. All the rituals and requirements of the old covenant are now meaningless. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Jesus takes his three closest disciples and he goes up on the mountain and, and they see Moses and they see Elijah and they see Jesus and it's this incredible time that they're like, oh, this is, this is amazing. And Peter says, hey, we need to stay here. We need to set up tents and, and do this thing. And then Jesus turns to them and they kind of, ah, and they fall down on the ground and Jesus is talking. And when they open their eyes again, Moses and Elijah are gone. It's just Jesus. You know why? You know what the whole point of that was? to tell them that Moses and Elijah are no longer part of that system. The only one that it's about now is Jesus. Listen to him. And he comes from another tribe. When we hit verse 13, we see this, right? And even in verse 15, verses 13 through 19, it tells us about this other tribe, right? Verse 15 says, If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, another priest, okay? Still a priest... Some of the same concepts, you still understand this, but one that is far better. The Old Covenant, many priests, they did it for a little while, then they didn't, they died, they stopped serving, this, that, and the other. But now there is one, Jesus, and he is better. He's from another tribe. And there's some great clues kind of built into this passage. The priest arising tells us about the virgin birth and the resurrection. Melchizedek had no parents shadowing the virgin birth. Melchizedek had the power of this indestructible life, which points us to the resurrection. Jesus is our eternal priest. Like this, all of that is built into this. Now, all of these details, there's tons of details, and there's, man, you could, you could study this passage and for hours and find just all sorts of things. And if, if you're like, if you do like the whole, the dry erase board, you can get a big four foot by eight foot dry erase board and just draw all sorts of stuff and lines and connections and dots. But why does all this matter? Why, why do we care about all these little details? I mean, we're under the new covenant, right? You know, we, we, we are not Old Testament Jews living in the sacrificial system. So what does all this stuff matter to us? Well, here's where it gets good. The central truth of this passage is just sort of tucked away here. This is where, let me tell you where your thoughts need to dwell when you hit Hebrews 7. This is where your hearts engage. Look at verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. Remember, following the law will not get you to heaven because you can't do it. Okay? Look at the Ten Commandments. You have broken every one of them, if you're going to be honest with yourself. The tribe of Levi, the Aaronic priesthood, that's not going to get you there. And on the other hand, as it continues on, there is a bringing in of a better hope. Because the Old Testament system of having to re-sacrifice again and again and again had a sense of hopelessness in it. There was an inability to bring true salvation. But it has been replaced with something that can. Through which, here it is, through which we draw near to God. That's what we need. That's, that's what we need. We need another tribe. We need another priest. We need one that's not just a type, one that's not just a picture, but the actual real thing. You know, sometimes when you're like, you want something or you're, there's something that you think is going to be great, and you know, like, oh, I want a new tool or I want a new car. Or, we want a new this or we want a new that or I need a new set of golf clubs or I, a new perfect whatever it is. You may, you may go to the Internet and find it online and, and capture that screen and print it out and stick it up on your bulletin board. And like, ah, oh, this is what I want. I'm saving up for this. I'm hoping to get this. And you know what? When you finally do get it, the real thing, that little picture, has no meaning anymore. Because I have the real thing right here. That's what Jesus is. He has a priesthood. His priesthood is not based on a name that he inherited or a tribe that he was in. Jesus' priesthood is based on his perfection as a human and his eternality as God. 
Jesus did what no priest could, what the sacrificial system could not. Jesus brought us near to God. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. And that is a better covenant. Now, God did create the Levitical system, and he did not make a mistake. Don't think, well, God made a mistake with that, or he didn't do it quite right. No, the Levitical priesthood was never intended to be this permanent connection to God. And, and when we start to wrap our minds around Jesus as our great high priest, the one who was promised, it gives us this great confidence in him. Because Jesus is the priest of the new covenant. All the blessings of the new covenant are found when we draw near to him. We can have freedom from guilt. One of the biggest problems that humans have is that we feel guilt. And someone who's not saved, that is going to cause all sorts of psychological trauma or whatever you want to call it. But it's guilt. It's guilt over sin. And the old system did not remove guilt. There's also the struggle with sin. We are not outside of Christ, freed from the struggle and the desire towards sin. The Old Testament Jews, they would try to draw near to God, but they were still slaves to sin. Under the new covenant, you are now a slave to righteousness. Your base desires actually change. You're given a new heart. The Holy Spirit dwells in you and your desires are for something different now. Works are no longer a factor. The old covenant, the covenant of works, didn't work. The new covenant, the covenant of grace, brings you near to God. In fact, in the old covenant, the, the, dynamic, the, the primary dynamic was sort of this, stay away, stay at arm's length. But the new covenant, now you draw near to God. And that's where I want to dwell for just a second. This idea, this heart, this central truth of the passage of drawing near to to God. It, it comes up in that last part of verse 19. It comes up again later on in verse 25. Remember, Old Testament, you cannot draw near to God. God is holy. You are not. That was abundantly clear again and again and again. The veil in the temple was to keep you separated. The whole vibe in one sense of the Old Testament was stay back because you're not holy. You remember Uzzah in 2 Samuel 6? The, 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 uh, they'd had a, a battle and the, the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the bad guys. And different things happened. And finally, finally, we're like, okay, we've got the Ark back and we're going to bring it back. And they're, they're bringing back the Ark. So the Ark, which was symbolic of the presence of God dwelling among them. And they drove the Ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, who had experienced great blessing when it came to his house, that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. They went to great effort, make a nice new cart and all this stuff to bring the ark. And then I guess there's a pothole or one of the, one of the, uh, one of the ox gets upset as they're bringing it in. Then they came to the threshing floor of Nacon. Here it is. And Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen nearly upset it. I mean, he's trying to do a good thing, right? Oh, no, the ark's about to fall. It's going to fall on the ground. I hope something doesn't break off. It's going to get dirty, what have you. Uzzah reaches out, and the anger of Yahweh burned against Uzzah. And God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark. The Old Testament is all about, in a sense, stay back. God is holy. The, the, the priest will offer a sacrifice to keep God's wrath at bay. But the truth is, God's desire for men has always been that they draw near. That's the lifeblood. That's the meaning of Christianity, to, to draw near to God. That's that relationship that he builds us for. Our primary participation in Christianity is this thing, this fundamental ambition that we should have is draw near to God. Having direct access to the king of the universe and the creator and owner of everything. Come into his presence. There is no greater privilege than to come into the presence to draw near to the Holy One. 
Remember Isaiah 6? Just seeing the Lord on his throne caused Isaiah to say, Whoa, woe is me. I am undone. And we have to remember Christianity is not about self-improvement. Go to, a, go to a bookstore and you'll find a section that says self-improvement. And it's, I don't know, several, many, many, many books. Self-help about every conceivable problem. And it's very easy for us as believers, as, as people who love the Lord, as people who love the Word, to sort of fall into this pragmatic thinking, what works, how it's always done, what I need to do, I need to get results. We, we know that Christianity has brought me good things. I'm saved. I'm, I'm generally happy in life. I'm, I'm stable. I'm contributing to society. I'm secure in things. My relationships are healthy. And that's all because of Jesus. That's true. And you can just kind of sit there and, okay, that's good. Salvation brings those things. Or, or you can even have the more spiritually mature view of things. Well, I'm doing all that, but I'm seeking to know him more. I, I'm studying his word. I'm, I'm living in increasing obedience. And all of that is a good thing and certainly very important. But outside of this idea of drawing near to God, I love how John MacArthur explains this. This is what he says. It's going to be up on the screen. The fullest expression of faith is to enter into the presence of God in his heavenly holy of holies and to fellowship with him. The fullest expression. The peak, the zenith, the, the ultimate destination is to draw near to God. Listen to, to Paul's prayer. Paul prays for us in Ephesians chapter 3. This is, this is beautiful. This is what he prays. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being firmly rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend, there's the head, comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And here's the heart. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. We can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. And not only can we, but we should. Not only should we, but we must. Because that is where you find the depth of what Christianity is all about. You, you can dance around on the surface and not really get where you need to be. You have to draw near to God. Ephesians 5 gives us this really just distinct connection between marriage and the gospel. It's real easy to look at marriage and some of the details of marriage and, and connect that to the gospel because that's the point. Think about your marriage. M most of you in here are married. Every godly committed husband should want, and I think does, desire to draw near to his wife. To, to, to know her better, to, to deepen the, the, the relationship that they have with one another, to know more about her. The same for, for the wives. A, a godly wife wants to draw near to and know and be in fellowship and communion and relationship with her husband. How do you do that? Well, it starts with an affection for them. It, it, you have to have a genuine commitment to them. But I think the primary element, something we can't miss... You all know this. I'm not telling you something you don't know. I'm just going to remind you of something that we need to hear, I think. It's this. Time. T-I-M-E. Time. You cannot draw near to your spouse if you're not spending time with them. Right? You have to be physically present in order to draw near to them. Now, you also have to be emotionally present and mentally present and spiritually present. Ed did a great job talking about that on Father's Day and pointing, pointing that out, how fathers need to be present. But that's for all of us. For our wives, it requires time and effort and intentionality and, and planning. Think about just the kind of some of the practical things of how that looks in marriage, right? You get married, and what's the first thing traditionally most people do? They go on a honeymoon. Right? You go on the hunt, you step away from the distractions of daily life so that you're just there with one another. Even if there's other people around, we are here on this trip, on this adventure, on this journey, doing this thing together, the two of us, setting aside all of that. It also shows value in that I have 
taken vacation time. I have set all of my other responsibilities aside. I've invested significant money. There is a lot of worth in this. And this is not just a cool vacation. This is about us being together with no other distractions. And it's time. You're spending time together. It's a few days, maybe a week. I had some friends that live in England, and they're, they did a six-month honeymoon. They had both spent their whole lives prior to that point saving up and planning for this six-month around-the-world honeymoon. Wow, that's some time. That's, that's some significant effort. But spending time, just the two of you, right? You know, it, it, you know I was talking just last week to, to somebody here in our church, and, and they were saying, oh, I just get so busy, I'm, I'm going to have to. And they were planning this thing to go away and just be with their wife just by themselves three days. Somebody who's been married like 50 years, and they're still in this intentional time alone with our wife, showing value to her, showing value to one another, whether it be gifts or thoughtful things or texts or, or notes or whatever. But, but it requires time, effort, intentionality, planning. There are a thousand little things that you can do day in, day out to show affection, to show value to your spouse. And here's the deal. It needs to be ongoing, right? Like you can't just say, okay, we're going to have dinner on Friday night. Dinner's done, we go home, see you next Friday night, I'm going to be busy this week, again and again and again. And expect that that's not going to have a significant negative impact on your relationship. If you're not drawing near regularly, engaging deeply with all of who you are, you're going to be missing out on, on what marriage is supposed to be and at best, and you're going to stumble and fall and have serious problems at worst. And there's this remarkable parallel between that whole idea, because e even the secular world understands you got to date your spouse. We hear that all the time, and it's true. But there's this remarkable parallel between that idea and drawing near to God. You, t drawing near to God requires first, I, I think, that you disconnect. Turn off the noise. Disconnect from, from the world. Go somewhere quiet. Turn off your phone. Get to where there are no distractions, nothing... There are so many things that compete for our time and our, and our energy and our thoughts and all that. We need to disconnect from that. And you need to pray. You cannot draw near to anyone without talking to them. You pray and you listen as well, right? For, for God, when we're talking about God, we talk to him in prayer. We listen to him through his word. He speaks to us through his word. So we pray and we listen. It has to be intentional, I think write is another thing, whether you're writing prayers or you're writing thoughts in response to his word or, or writing something else. The, the, the difference between the swirling thoughts in your head about this and about that and the other and really just focused communion, I think, is writing it down. Journaling. Worship. Uh, there's another idea of worship, right? Whether, whether we're talking about listening to worship music or singing along with it or, or just marveling at God's creation. Just looking at the beauty of a sunset and, and worshiping him for that. The worship is this emotional expression of praise to God that says, I value who you are and what you have done above all other things. And of course, all of these come with time. You cannot draw near to God in the way that he really wants you to with just a few minutes here, a few minutes there. You need, especially in this frenetic, chaotic life that we have, where there's always one more thing coming, one more thing to do. You need extended, focused, intentional time spent purposefully drawing near. And maybe you need to do it in a way you've not done it before. Break the system, do something new, do something different. Psalm 40 uh, has this, this beautiful picture and this promise that no matter where you are, when you draw near to God, when you cry out to your Father, He will answer. It says He'll set your feet on a rock. Not, not just on a rock, on a high rock. He will lift you up. It says He will establish your steps, your circumstances. He'll put those in line as they need to be. He'll put a new song in your mouth. There's the heart. When we draw near to Him, He puts a new song in your mouth. On your way out of the sanctuary today, there's over on the, in the foyer, there's a sheet about drawing near to God that has this plan and this path and this way to do that that I think would be very helpful to you. I would encourage you to grab one 
and look at it and, and draw near to God. Spend time this week daily best, but spend time drawing near to God in a way that you haven't done before. Be intentional, be purposeful. Say, you know what, I'm going to set everything aside for this hour in a different way. And understand, intentionality is key, it's important, it's, it's central. This is not just a box to check. This is not just something to put on your schedule and say, okay, it's 2 o'clock, time to do this. This is not something you do casually or nonchalantly. You have to be intentional. You have to be purposeful. You have to be doing this to draw near to God. It's like I don't just stop in at the house when I'm done with the work and say, hey, wife, good to see you. Hi, kids. I'm going to go to my study and read. No, I'm purposeful and coming home and talking, what are we going to do and planning through. We have to be intentional in that. This is not just an academic exercise. This is not a, a school assignment that we do to turn into the teacher. Drawing near to God, we have to understand coming into his presence, it is his design for you as a believer. It is his plan for you. It is his will for you as a believer, you want to know what God's will is for your life? Number one, draw near to Him. And I think when we're doing that throughout our, throughout our week, when that becomes part of the ebb and flow, and it might, it's going to look different for all of us, but when, when that becomes part of the ebb and flow of our lives, Sundays are even sweeter because corporately we are together drawing near to God. We were given a promise in Hebrews 4, three chapters back. Therefore, it says... Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Time of need is all the time. If you ever think you're not in a time of need, stop. You are. But because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus when he hung on the cross. Because of the blood that was poured out for us. Because he bore our sins. Because God's wrath against sin, against your sin, against my sin has been satisfied, we can draw near to him. And then when we hit verse 23, here it gets cool. There's this whole idea of intercession. Because of his intercession, this is a bit. After Jesus accomplished our salvation on the cross and went back to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father where he is praying purposefully, intentionally, actively, constantly for you to draw near. That should bring joy. That should bring confidence. Not only that we can draw near to God, but that our case of what's going on in our life is being poured out to God on behalf of us by Jesus, the Son, who's sitting at the God, at Father's right hand. Our case, our struggles, our our difficulties, our, our situation is being pled before the Father continually right there. And, and, and there's built into this as we, as we look at this. Right, It says in verse 25, He is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful promise, but there's a little stop, evaluate for a minute. Because there's a heart transformation that takes place in salvation. A desire is placed in you. Your affections will change from sin to righteousness. It doesn't mean you're going to be sinless, but it does mean you will sin less. You will long deeply to draw near to Him. If there's no desire in your heart to draw near to Him... No desire to spend time with Him. No, 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 no longing to commune with Christ. You might not know Him. So that's a scary thing. In religious activity, doing all the stuff, as good as it is, as wonderful as it is, as, as required of a believer as it is, it is not a guarantee of salvation. And, and then right at the very end, these last three verses here, it sort of brings everything full circle from where we started last week when I was talking about what is perfect, what is perfect, this is perfect, that is perfect. The perfect one is pointed back to. I love it. We're, we, we're, we're sort of coming back into talking about Melchizedek and, and the priest. And remember, the whole point, I think the whole point of Melchizedek is that there has always been a plan for something greater than the Levitical priesthood. Because just like you, just like me, the priests were sinners. They struggled with sin. 
That, that's why they had to offer sacrifices for themselves first. Like before I, I, I deal with the, the sins of the people, I have to offer a sacrifice for myself. And then, and then I can do that and, and mine will be imperfect because I'm imperfect. But, but you see, we draw near to God because of the perfect one. What a wonderful thing to meditate on. The perfect one who made a sacrifice for me. I mean, we all have things that we're good at. You probably have something that you're better at than everybody that you know. But no matter how good you are at fill in the blank, you're not perfect. But Jesus is. No matter how spiritually mature you are. I love it. It pulls right back to focusing our mind's attention and hopefully our heart's affection on the perfection, the perfect awesomeness of Jesus. Because we need a high priest who is holy, it says. From eternity past to eternity future, Jesus is holy and incapable of sin. He is innocent, meaning that he always did good to others. He never did anything to cause any harm or any wrong or any slight to anyone in any way. He is undefiled. There's not a single blemish of anything on him, never a stain of sin in any way. Nothing affected him by, or brought him low when he came into contact with sin or sinners. In fact, Jesus had more direct contact with Satan than anyone, and he still emerged unblemished, undefiled. He is separated from sinners, meaning he's around people, but he doesn't become like them. He doesn't become influenced by them. We all need to remember we are influenced by those that we're around. You can't spend time around other people without being influenced by them. But Jesus was not influenced by that. And ultimately, it says he was exalted. Remember, we're told that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. He is the perfect one. It comes full circle. Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one who brings us to God, so we must draw near to him. And if you have never trusted in Christ, if you have never drawn near to him today, if you hear his voice, if you hear the message of salvation, do not harden your heart, but come to Christ. He desires for you to draw near to him. Remember, the central purpose of God in our salvation is to draw near to Him. And not doing that will drain your soul. That is your greatest need, to draw near to God. If you're at a spiritual high like you've never been before, your greatest need is to draw near to God. If you're at a spiritual low, lower than you've ever been before, your greatest need is to draw near to God. If you're just kind of in a slump, like, okay, whatever, your greatest need is to draw near to God. If you're struggling and fighting against whatever it is, your greatest need is to draw near to God. If you're feeling a little held back, like, ah, your greatest need is to draw near to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and cry. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this, oh, this passage, as, as always, that even though there is so much in here to think about and process and look at and consider, and, 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 and dots to connect and, and all these confusing things. Thank you, though, that right in the middle of that is this beautiful reminder that not only can we draw near to you, not only should we draw near to you, but we can and we must. And you have done what needs to be done so that we draw near to you and enter into a deeper relationship with you. Let the cry of our hearts to be near to you. We pray this in Jesus' holy, perfect, awesome name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
Spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. When death and hell I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood. My life is in with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior. Two quick things before you go. Um, one, if you haven't heard, uh, Cindy Goff passed away on Friday. Um, she apparently had a massive heart attack, uh, kind of unexpected. Um, so we're certainly grieving. Keep Linda and her sister and, and the rest of the family and all her friends. Um, I mean, who didn't love Cindy Goff, right? We, but just keep her, keep the family in your prayers. Currently, the plan, um, if nothing changes, is for a visitation next Sunday afternoon. And the funeral will be Monday the 25th here at Fellowship. Um, also, VBS is coming up. That begins tomorrow. You've probably noticed some of the things as you've walked around. Starts at 6 o'clock right here. Um, if you want to help, I'm sure there's still room for you to help. So just let us know. And if you have kids or no kids in your neighborhood, bring them on. We are ready. We'll start at 6. Uh, we're done at 8.30 each evening, and it's going to be a fun, exciting time. So don't miss out on that. Just come and walk around and experience the excitement. So anything else have I forgotten? Okay, there's stuff in your bulletin. Check your bulletin for all the other announcements. Watch me.